This is the second of three videos about the early history of computing and uh, early video games and sound in early games. In this edition, we'll be looking at the very earliest computing machines, the very earliest video games, and uh, we'll be following these threads through the late 1970s, early 1980s. So on this first slide, we see one of the very earliest computing machines. Early computers, or the predecessors to modern computers, um, were generally large machines, you know, taking up most of a room. Um, they had to be operated manually through a series of switches or tubes or punch cards. Frequently, they were very much analog machines, and they were very limited in their tasks. They generally had uh, little to no memory. Um, you would have to spend time entering a program that you wanted to run in uh, manually through a series of punch cards or through physically configuring the machine. And they were limited to simple computing tasks, um, you know, basic sort of calculations, things like that. So the Zeus Z3 is one of the earliest uh, examples built by Conrad Zusa. Um, this, I believe, is actually a replica, but this is in a, in a museum. And it was a sort of purely mathematical device that was a predecessor to some modern computers. Um, the media theorist Friedrich Kittler has this idea that a lot of communication technologies are sort of accelerated by the military and accelerated by war. And that's very much the case in early computing as well. You may be familiar with the Enigma machine, which is a famous German um, code machine. It's the image on the top. It's the size of a large typewriter. Um, and so the Enigma was a, a physical analog machine for encoding messages. One of the ways that the Enigma machine spurred early computing, and that World War II in general spurred early computing, uh, is seen in the figure of Alan Turing, this early computation uh, pioneer, a mathematician. You may have seen the movie The Imitation Game from a couple of years ago, all about Turing and a team of code breakers at Bletchley Park in England, uh, whose task it was to sort of reverse engineer the, the Enigma machine. And so uh, the image on the bottom is actually a still from the movie, but Turing's machine looks somewhat like that. Um, Turing invented a device that would sort of crunch through all of the possibilities. So those tumblers you see are actual physical things that, that move. Um, and the design here is to reverse engineer the way the Enigma machine works through sort of sheer computational power. And at the time there, you can see the thing is the size of a truck. Um, and it sort of churns physically through uh, the numbers that are required. But it basically does computations. It's, you know, much less powerful than anything we have today. But at the time, uh, the ability to do computations of a couple of them per second was considered just radically, uh, radically game-changing. Next we come to ENIAC uh, from 1946. ENIAC is the earliest programmable computer. Um, it's essentially, you know, a collection of, of smaller computers, and as you can see here, it's literally an entire room. It has multiple staff members um, who program it physically by changing switches, by plugging cables from one port into the next, and uh, people would spend, you know, days designing a program for ENIAC to run, designing a system of computations, and then days to enter the program and then you would run it and you would sort of get the output and analyze it. Um, but it's the earliest, you know, precursor of supercomputers. If you wanted to run really complicated sort of physics equations or something like that, predict how a material would act or predict how a trajectory would go, um, you would write yourself code and enter it on uh, a supercomputer like ENIAC and it would take days to run or days to uh, to make this computation work but this is the first sort of fully programmable reconfigurable uh, modern antecedent to computers. <laughs> 
If we skip ahead a little bit, we get into the early history of games. And so ENIAC, the last slide said, was at the University of Pennsylvania. You know, Harvard had a big mainframe, MIT, all those sort of research universities, California, things like that, started to get giant mainframe computers in the late 1940s, early 1950s. And for a long time, uh, universities were the only place you could really reliably have access to computers and have the power to sort of experiment and do new things with them. Um, so in 1962, a researcher at MIT named Steve Russell, you know, in his idle time when he was bored or when he was procrastinating, um, used this, uh, all of this power at his fingertips to create the first digital game. And remember, before this time we had, you know, pinball machines and things like that were commonly found in arcades, but this is the first digital game. His game was called Space War. Um, I'm going to play some footage in a moment, but you'll see that essentially there's a sun in the center that exerts a very strong gravitational pull, and then uh, it had basically uh, two little spaceships, bright dots on the uh, monitor, that would attempt to shoot each other. So it's a two-player game. Uh, you'll see when the start screen flashes up, one player is on one side of the keyboard, one player is on the other side of the keyboard. Uh, you kind of orbit around each other, you want to shoot each other, and you want to avoid falling into the sun. So as you'll see, that's actually very difficult. Winning a game of Space War is sort of a matter of, of surviving for 20 seconds or so while your partner gets sucked into the sun, and you win. So here's a little bit of footage of Space War. If we fast forward a couple of years later, actually almost a decade later, to 1971, we see uh, an adaptation of Space War called Computer Space. Uh, and this is created by Nolan Bushnell and Ted Dabney, who are two game developers who would go on to start the Atari company the next year, the first really famous American video game company. And so Computer Space is an adaptation of Space War. Uh, it keeps the two, the one-on-one, -on -one, you know, two-player game. It also adds a single player mode where you have a rocket and you have to shoot at a pair of flying saucers and you want to uh, kill them more often than they kill you. So Computer Space is the first commercially sold arcade game. Um, your video arcade game, sorry. The first commercially sold video arcade game uh, where they were trying to market it to people who owned arcades, people who owned, you know, pizza parlors, bowling alleys, things like that. Uh, this was actually a product that those business owners would buy, put in their shops. Uh, so before this point, uh, games circulated informally, you know, academics and researchers and things like that who would create them, share them with their friends, swap them, you know, physically on discs. Things circulated informally, and this is the first commercially released and sold uh, video game. This is just another little shot of uh, how computer space looked. As you can see, it's marginally more sophisticated than the original Space War. It has a little score sheet on the side, um, but uh, is still, still very simple by today's standards, and still had no sound. So, Pong. The very next year, Atari has now been founded by the same people who put out Computer Space, and uh, they create the iconic game Pong. You can see on the console there, this is a two-player game. Each player has a sort of dial with which they turn left or right, and they move their paddle up and down. And Pong has a very simple soundtrack, as you'll hear in just a moment. Basically, the sounds of Pong are that it makes uh, one high-pitched beep when the ball hits a paddle, a beep an octave lower when the ball hits one of the walls at the top or the bottom of the screen and bounces back, 
and then a loud buzzer at that same pitch um, when a player scores a goal. So there are really only three sounds, and they're very simply related to each other. You've got one sound, and then you have you know twice the frequency for an octave up uh, for the sound of the paddle. So this is just a slightly better image of what the gameplay of Pong actually looks like. It just goes left to right, and you see the score across the top. And let's look at a little bit of footage of Pong. So as I said, these early games were arcade releases. 1971, Computer Space is the first digital game sold and placed in arcades, so was Pong. And uh, right around the end of 72 into early 1973, we start to see home video games, the very first home consoles which would plug into your TV. Um, and usually these were simple boxes, as you see here, the Magnavox Odyssey. Um, and they did not have interchangeable cartridges. You bought the Odyssey, it was loaded with a certain number of games, um, and that was it. That was all it could do. Um, you can see one of the Odyssey controllers here. It's a pair of those little wheels, just like the Pong game would have, um, that you could hold in your hand and twist. And uh, it's funny because the Odyssey is basically, it's basically restricted to sort of Pong-like games. Um, we'll watch the commercial in just a moment here, and you can sort of see they, they have all of these different uh, actually colored gels that you would put on your TV to give kind of a different look. And you'll see in the commercial they have, you know, Pong, then they have ice hockey, and look, it's basically Pong, and, uh, and a variety of other games. Skiing, where you sort of have to navigate your Pong paddle through an obstacle course. Uh, so the earliest home consoles were very, very simple. Um, as I said, games were just coded right into the system. Interchangeable cartridges wouldn't appear until the late 70s with one of the Coleco um, consoles. And then in 1977, the uh, Atari video computer system would come out, and that would actually have modern cartridges uh, to some degree as we know them. So here's the Odyssey TV commercial from 1973. Magnavox presents Odyssey, the electronic game of the future. Odyssey easily attaches to any brand TV, black and white or color, to create a closed circuit electronic playground. Odyssey gives you all the exciting action of hockey and 11 other challenging play and learning games for the entire family. Odyssey, a new dimension for your television. Now at your Magnavox dealer. He's listed in the yellow pages. Another little interesting footnote in the history of video games and game sound is uh, Missile Attack by Mattel, and this is the first handheld electronic game. Uh, we'll watch footage of this as well. You'll see that what it does is there's a, a simple little screen on the right that is basically a series of lights, and uh, you move the switch on the bottom right in order to move your light from right to left. Uh, at the top, the uh, computer shoots little balls of light at you and you have to sort of shoot back at these to stop them in their path. Um, you know, I guess you're shooting down the missiles. That's the missile attack. And uh, the game is, you know, very mechanical. It's very simple. And then um, when you lose, as you'll hear, you get just the first couple of notes of taps. You know, the sort of military tune. Um, the da 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 You know that one. Um, so you get just the first couple of notes of that as a little indicator that you died, you have to start over again. So, by the late 1970s, um, the home video game market is exploding. Um, you know, Atari came out with Pong in 1972. The first wave of Pong imitations were coming home in late 72, early 73. And so in the span of four years, the home video game console market explodes. Different companies 
um, start to put out their own video games. There are all the Magnavox ones. There's uh, Coleco. You know, Atari enters the market here in 1977. They also had their own home pong systems earlier than that. Uh, Nintendo is starting to have sort of single, you know, home games. Um, even like Sears, you can find, um, you know, Sears brand electronic entertainment. And these are, are sort of marketed at department stores right alongside TVs. The Atari is, is uh, one of the most significant modern consoles, though. As you can see, it comes with a joystick. It uses interchangeable cartridges. Uh, it would be massively popular. It stayed in production through the 1990s, uh, you know, 77 to 1992. You could actually still buy the Atari VCS, or as it was later sort of rebranded when its sequel came out, they called it the Atari 2600. Um, in the excerpts that I asked you to watch from the Beep documentary history of game sound, you got to hear a little bit about programming the Atari. The Atari's sound system was very, very limited. Um, you only had 32 notes total, and that was across several octaves. So as we know, there are 12 notes per octave, and that's uh, it's not going to work out to be enough notes if you spread that across several octaves. So composers for the Atari were actually very limited in um, the palette of notes that they were able to use. Let's go ahead and watch just a little uh, clip of one Atari game that sort of illustrates how limited that musical palette was. This is a game called uh, The Mountain King, and it uses a famous piece of classical music that's also called In the Hall of the Mountain King um, that you'll probably recognize. And it sort of has this uh, very interesting rendition on the limited uh, Atari sound system. So the late 70s kind of usher in what we would think of as the, the first golden age of video games. Um, a lot of iconic retro games are released around this time. Space Invaders, Missile Command, uh, Asteroids, Centipede, Pac-Man. You know, video games are exploding both in arcades and also on home consoles. So video games are starting to become really, really big business around the late 70s. Um, you know, other forms of media are getting involved. It's sort of particularly fun for this class on music and video games to point out that there were a couple of Journey video games, for example. Uh, if you look at the bottom right of this picture, that's actually a, uh, the game art and an album cover. There's literally a Journey sort of tie-in game for their album Escape. Um, we're going to play just a little bit of it here, and you can hear that it actually uh, includes their very famous song, Don't Stop Believin'. By the, the first couple of years in the 1980s, um, the video game market starts to get really, really saturated. 
Um, there are a lot of competing consoles. The market is sort of disordered. There are competing consoles. Nothing is compatible with other consoles. You know, each company's games are sort of proprietary only for their hardware. Um, people are getting frustrated because of that. There's such a profit rush uh, to get games out on the market that a lot of them are programmed too fast. Uh, a lot of them are considered low quality. And uh, really, people start to wonder, oh, maybe this was a fad. Maybe playing games on your TV at home was just a sort of flash in the pan. It was great. We made a lot of money in five years or so, and now it's kind of over. Um, you know, so demand for video games really plummets. A lot of times this is specifically pegged towards um, this game E.T. for the Atari. It's sort of specifically singled out as a lower quality game. It's a movie tie-in, but it wasn't very successful. Uh, Atari, there's this whole story about how Atari, you know, massively overestimated. They thought this would be a hit. Um, they underfunded the development. It wasn't actually very successful, and they had to go out and bury uh, a bunch of extra copies of the game out in the New Mexico desert. There's an entire documentary, actually, that you can watch about this story called Atari Game Over from 2014, and I'm going to place a link to that uh, in the class. If you'd like to know more, it's a little more than an hour long, and it's free on YouTube, so you can go and watch Atari Game Over if you'd like to hear more about the great video game crash, the way that Atari had started this market uh, 11 years earlier, and now suddenly was sort of at the center was the poster child for what people thought was the failure of video games in the early 80s. But as we know, uh, it wouldn't be an actual long-term failure since the Famicom, as it was known in Japan, and the Nintendo Entertainment System would come out really at the end of 1983. Then it would make its way to America in late 1985, Europe in 1986, and uh, this was one of the events that really turned the video game industry around and uh, made things much bigger and more profitable again. So that the great video game crash of the early 80s turned out to sort of be just a little dip in the popularity and uh, the viability of games as an industry. So I hope this has been useful as a little tour of some of the development of early games uh, with a little bit of an emphasis on how early computing led to the earliest games and a few examples of the sound and music that we found in early games. In the third and final uh, installment of this section, we are going to look a little bit more at the actual technologies that were used to produce sound in early games.